What is attack hams? Why is it important to Ukraine? And why is it probably going to be used in a way that you might not expect? Now, I did a story with journalist Tim Mack of the counteroffensive. This video is the companion to that article. So if you want to read more about the system, head on over to that article. It's in the description below. So every army has a need for a short to medium range precision strike ballistic missile that can be used by the commander on the ground for time sensitive targets or TSTs. Think of it like um, your intel network finds out that a top adversary general is at a rear area training base and he's there to review the troops, but he's only going to be there for a few hours. Now, the guy's not stupid. He's not coming to the front lines within range of artillery. But let's say you're a division commander in the U.S. Army and you're assigned to fight this guy's forces. If you want to take him out, you kind of have to go through this Denny's menu of options to service this target. You might task a drone, but a drone could get shot down. You might try to insert a sniper team, but their helicopter could get shot down on the insert. And then you have to extract that team after they're done servicing the target. You might try to attack with your division's aviation assets like Apache helicopters, but again, they could get shot down. Now, you might ask the Air Force, <laughs> but they're, they're off doing Air Force things. Look, Air Force is going to Air Force. It could take hours for them to get a strike package together if they even do it at all. Now, this needs to be an army show. It, you need a way to reach deep into enemy territory with a big bomb and drop it on the guy's head. You need attack cams. Quick history. See, back in the late 1950s, the Army was faced with a crisis. The Air Force was stealing the show. It was the jet age. We pretty much thought we could win wars with jets by flying over the enemy and dropping nuclear weapons. So how could the U.S. Army even be relevant on the modern nuclear battlefield? Well, they would have to get their own nukes too. The Army formed this concept called the Pentomic Army, meaning Penta for five and Tomic for atomic. The whole idea was that the army division would be split into five battalions, Penta, and the division would have its own nuclear missiles in the form of the MGR-1 Honest John. These smaller battalions would make less attractive targets for Soviet nuclear weapons, and they could operate dispersed, come together for an attack, and that attack would be spearheaded by a nuclear warhead from an Honest John. Then they would run through the nuclear fallout break through the gap that was created by the nuclear weapon and exploit a breakthrough. And yes, we actually tried this and thought it was a good idea. Now, by the Vietnam War, we had stopped all this foolishness, but we kept the idea of giving division commanders an option for deep strikes that were division organized and time sensitive without having to call the Air Force and interrupt their golf game. The MGM-52 Lance replaced the Honest John. This weapon could carry nuclear warheads or a single conventional unitary warhead for taking out bunkers. And it could also carry cluster munitions, which are basically many small grenades that are tossed from the missile like the Johnny Appleseed of death for anti-personnel and anti-vehicle use. Now, the Lance was showing its age by the late 1970s, and in a lot of ways, nuclear weapons aren't that useful to a battlefield commander. There could be political consequences for using them, and the guidance technology was getting smarter with miniaturization. I mean, back in the 1950s, you kind of needed a nuclear weapon because the guidance systems on these weapons weren't all that surgical. If you needed to take out a bridge, it was just easier to take out the entire city with a nuclear weapon, and the bridge goes with it. But the first GPS satellite was launched in 1978. The technology was in its infancy, but it was getting ready for its debut. Now, by the 1980s, we had this concept called Airland Battle 2000, which was this playbook for a future war that emphasized the doctrine of flexibility, maneuverability, lethality, and responsiveness. Synchronization is one of the basic tenets of Airland Battlefield operations. Its successful application depends on focusing combat power where it is needed, through the coordinated effort by all echelons of the force at the same time towards the primary goal set by the commander who must be prepared to use all his available combat resources to successfully carry out the battlefield mission. Basically, the idea of airland battle was that a battle leader could act independently as the situation changed, as long as they were still following the commander's intent. 
and a new ballistic missile replacement for the Lance would give that battlefield commander more flexibility to engage targets of opportunity within their battle space without having to call the Air Force. The original intent for the Lance missile's replacement was the JTAC-Ms, or Joint Tactical Missile System. This weapon was supposed to be a joint development between the Air Force and the Army, but the Air Force decided it wanted long-range cruise missiles instead, so it backed out of the program. So now it was an Army show. The development took nine years, basically the entire 1980s, but by 1990, they had a theater ballistic missile that pretty much worked. The M39 Attack Ams Block 1 carried 950 M74 cluster munitions and had a flight range of 165 kilometers and two of them could fit inside the launch bays of an M270 multiple rocket launch system. Oh, one more thing. What's kind of neat is that the container the missile came in was disguised as a regular M26 anti-personnel rocket container. You see this front cover that looks like a Lego? Does it contain six small M26 rockets or one big attack ham? Surprise! Attack hams! Attack hams debuted during Operation Desert Storm. 24 attack hams fire missions were ordered, and a total of 32 Block 1 missiles were fired. Ten of the missions were seed or suppression of enemy air defenses. That's where you take out enemy radars and surface air missile launchers. The other target sets included logistics and refueling sites, as well as some Iraqi army rocket staging bases and, in one case, a bridge. And what was kind of neat was that command and control was simple. You didn't need to call and get the Air Force out of bed. You just saw the target, launch the rocket. Now, the period after Operation Desert Storm saw the creation of the upgraded M39A1, which is essentially an M39, but with a range of 300 kilometers, although it only carried 300 cluster munitions. By the early 2000s, the M48 attack hams variant was developed. This held a single 500 pound unitary warhead, which would be useful for point targets like buildings or lightly fortified command bunkers. Now, this wasn't a warhead that was designed to penetrate a bunker or take out a bridge, but it was still useful if you found two terrorists were meeting up in a house. By Operation Iraqi Freedom, the U.S. fired 414 attack cams, mainly the M39A1 rounds, but also some of the early unitary rounds. The targets were mainly seed, suppression of enemy air defenses, but they were also fired at targets of opportunity. And that's what's kind of neat here. Remember on March 25th, the coalition was five days into the ground war of Operation Iraqi Freedom, and a sandstorm basically grounded all of the helicopters and aircraft flying in support of the coalition. But attack cams continued to fire and strike deep into targets in Iraq. It was the attack cams that kept up the fight while the Air Force was grounded or impaired. Weather really doesn't affect attack cams. Now, there were a few more versions of the missile that were created. The, there is this Block II BAT, uh, which contained 13 brilliant anti-armor technology submunitions that never quite got off the ground. Then there was the M57 variant, which increased the accuracy of the attack cams to a 9-meter circle. Then there was the M57E1, which essentially took the older M39s and M39A1s and refurbished them up to M57 standards while adding airburst capability. This system was also adapted for the M142 HIMARS system. So now attack cams could be fired from two different kinds of launchers, MRLS or HIMARS. The attack cams is currently being replaced by the Precision Strike Missile, which has a longer range than attack cams and carries two rounds per launch pod as opposed to a single pod of attack cams. And in a lot of ways, this might be why the U.S. has agreed to donate attack cams to Ukraine. It's been over a year and a half since the war in Ukraine started, and the Precision Strike Missile is almost ready to be fielded. In America, we tend to eat our fill before giving away leftovers. So. How will this missile be used in Ukraine? Well, since the war started, Ukraine has begged for this weapon, and a lot of people think it would be used to attack the Kerch Strait Bridge, but that might not be the best use case. Just, just hear me out. It sounds like Ukraine will be getting the cluster bomb variant of the attack AM. So either we're talking the M39 or the M39A1. That's not very useful against a bridge, especially one as big as the Kerch Strait Bridge but it could be very useful for taking out Russian surface-to-air missile radars. This will force Russia to pull its surface-to-air missile systems even further back into Crimea, 
which gives Ukraine space to operate over the front lines and perform air operations. If Ukraine gets word that a munitions train is crossing the Kerch Strait Bridge, well, they can fire at that train. And since the attack cams is a guided missile, they can have it arrive right as that train is crossing the bridge. If Ukraine hears that an important general is visiting a field command post, they can call in an attack cam strike on that command post. It would take minutes. It really gives the option to strike soft targets in a time-sensitive manner. Now, yeah, a lot of this stuff could be done with cruise missiles that Ukraine currently has, like the British Storm Shadow. I mean, the Sevastopol naval base was just struck with the Storm Shadow missile on the 23rd of September, and it was a successful operation. Ukraine had to launch Su-24 bombers, they had to fly to their release point, they had to release the weapons, and they had to hope that the cruise missiles, which incidentally aren't traveling that fast, maybe 0 0.8, 0 0.9 Mach, got there in time to catch whatever high-ranking admiral while he was still there. The attack AMS flies at Mach 3 in a ballistic trajectory, and it can be launched without asking the Air Force to fly their plane. So it complements weapons like the Storm Shadow by sacrificing a little bit of warhead payload for speed on time-sensitive targets. It's another tool in the toolkit that creates dilemmas, not problems, for Russia. Hey, if you like this video, head on over to counteroffensive.news and read my article that gets a little bit deeper into the attack cams missile. And thank you guys so much for watching. In a world where fashion meets firepower, where style becomes strategy, it's time to gear up for the ultimate mission with Bunker Brandy. Introducing the Rock Out With Your Chalk Out t-shirt, a tribute to the fearless air cavalry. Feel the adrenaline rush as you don the pride of the skies. For those of you who dare from the air, precision and power unite when you think outside the bomb. And don't miss our Live Laugh Launch t-shirts for Patriot and High Mars, because sometimes defending freedom means bringing the thunder. Finally, for the true defender of the seas, we present Department of the Boat People. Sail with honor and show your allegiance to the world's mightiest maritime force. With these shirts, hoodies, and stickers, along with the tow missile, landmines, and drone warfare. These aren't just shirts, they're statements. They're your way of saying I stand for strength, unity, and style. Get yours at Bunker Branding today.